there's a shock in the morning when you wake up and realize where you are. You think, this can't be my life. There's been a mistake. It took a lot of adjustment. It still does. That was written by Christopher Reeve. His new book, Still Me, and his heartbreaking and hopeful and triumphant story. In it, he candidly describes his battle to rebuild his life. It was just about three years ago when the unthinkable happened. During a riding competition, Christopher Reeve, known to millions around the world as Superman, was thrown headfirst from his horse in an accident that broke his neck and left him unable to move or breathe. In the spring of 1995, Christopher Reeve was doing what he loved to do. But in the blink of an eye, that tragic fall left him on the brink of death. The impact of the landing broke my first and second vertebrae. I was heard to say, I can't breathe. And that was it. The whole world was shocked by the news that the actor, known to all of us as Superman, had been paralyzed from the neck down, requiring the aid of a ventilator to even breathe. It was a life no one would have imagined for him. It was a life he was not sure he even wanted to live. Dana came into the room. She knelt down next to me and we made eye contact. And then I mouthed my first lucid words to her. Maybe we should let me go. Dana started crying. And then she added the words that saved my life. You're still you. And I love you. Today, in his first visit to our show, Christopher Reeve shares with all of us what his life is like now and how he survived the darkest days. It is an inspiration to every living human being. Welcome, Christopher Reeve. Yeah. 
I woke up after four days of being completely unconscious. I mean, they had me snowed on morphine, and uh, finally I, I came out of it and um, gradually realized my situation. And uh, Dana came into the room, and uh, just as you described it is how it happened. But the main thing is, when she said, you're still you and I love you, if there'd been a pause or if she'd looked away or somehow, you know, not answered me immediately and instinctively, I would have felt she was just you know, undertaking an obligation. But it's not an obligation. It's just, uh, just her love for me. And uh, I joked and I said, I'm taking the marriage vows a little too far. I mean, we talked about sickness and health, but... Um, Nobody's prepared for this. No one's prepared for this. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing is, actually, we were prepared for this or for whatever comes. Now, and you say, well, that was the pivotal moment, but also when your son came into the room. Yeah. And it is the way if, that he approached you. And if he had been afraid to touch you or been afraid. Right. Or saw you had seen the fear in his eyes. So that was also major. At first, he was afraid, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it took him a few days to be able to come in uh, because the whole hospital environment is scary and uh, all these scrubs and nurses and doctors walking around and all that and he didn't know what to expect but uh, Dana convinced him it was okay to come in and that I looked, looked the same I was just lying down and he came in and that you were still daddy but you just uh, couldn't stand he said a beautiful thing mm -hmm. he said dad can't stand anymore right I said, and Daddy can't run anymore, right? And he said, and Daddy can't, you know, play the way we used to anymore, right? Then he thought for a while, he was only two years old, just about to turn three. He thought for a moment and he said, but he can still smile. Three years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's different, but we're as close, if not closer than we ever have been. Do you look at breathing now completely differently than you? Yeah. Yeah. You it think? is that you, you don't take a breath for granted. That, yeah, breathing is your birthright. Mm -hmm. You know, breathing and walking you think you take for free. Uh, but both of those are, 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 would be, you know, like monumental accomplishments. Uh, but it's coming, both breathing and walking, I believe, uh, will happen as we develop therapy and uh, a cure within the next three to four years. So you no longer linger in that space where you define so candidly in um, Still Me of thinking if the jump had been different, if your hand had been positioned differently, right. if, the, if the horse had moved to the left, if you had fallen a couple of inches to the left instead of to the right, how would, different it would have I been? I would have been bruised. Would have been bruised. Uh, no, I can't do that because it's just, uh, it takes me backwards instead of forwards, and I don't want to go there. But you were there for a while. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. it happens, you know. Uh, and you you feel guilty in a way. Uh, you know, I think, like, how much trouble I've caused everybody. Right. Yeah, you talked about um, you were in Dana's life on page 44, and Will's life, we've all been destroyed by this stupid thing that happened over a nothing jump. For some reason, I didn't get my hands down to break my fall. I'm an idiot. Yeah, I thought that. Mm -hmm. You know, but the fact is nobody else is blaming me. I'm doing a, he was doing a pretty good job of blaming myself. Uh, but none of them held it against me or thought it was my fault. On page 43, you say, I'd wake up and be staring at everything, staring at the wall, staring at myself, staring at the future, staring in disbelief. Yeah, you're in shell shock. You know, you just cannot believe your life went this way because you have a map, you know, you have an idea where you're going. You have goals and aspirations, and I was really, I felt, uh, at about age 42, I was really entering my prime, both personally and professionally, and I thought this is, uh, you know, we're really headed for the good stuff now, and... Uh, to suddenly have this happen was just, you know, disbelief, you know, and then again, uh, you know, you think, why me? And then you think about all the things. 
that you could have done differently and you blame yourself. And Did all. you know at the time that your mother wanted to pull the plug? Uh, yeah, because uh, we'd often talked about it and I always said, you know, if anything, uh, you know, really, really bad were to happen to me, if I couldn't have uh, the life that I was used to, wouldn't we, it wouldn't be worth living. So I had said that many, many times and uh, when she came to the hospital and talked about that, she was um, trying to see to my wishes. And wasn't it Dana and, who fought back? Well, Dana and her family, and there was a, a big discussion uh, around, of course, I was not aware of any of this, but uh, Dana and my brother Ben really together uh, convinced my mother that it's my decision. And Dana said, wait till he wakes up, wait till he understands where he is, and then he can decide, but it's not, not for anybody else to choose the future. When we come back, we'll meet Christopher's wife, Dan. So, what would you pay for an Arby's sub? Six ninety-five. Would you believe any two subs for just four bucks? Nah. No, no way. For this much meat in a sub, I would have expected to be a lot more. Honest, any two for just four bucks. For all that you get in this sandwich, that is a great price. Don't put everybody else out of business. <laughs> you can go anywhere and get filled up, but you can only get the two subs for four dollars deal at Arby's. Get ready for your newest edition of Team 11 magazine. Look for Jeff Heights and Chris Peterson on the cover. And inside you'll find great savings from... Save $50 on your next pair of eyeglasses at the Con and Deal Centers for Progressive Eye Care. Show your love with a gift from Northwood Jewelers. We're above the crowd. Experience the difference with Remax. Don't miss the big 1.9% spring sales drive at your local Chevy dealers. Look for details inside your Team 11 magazine. From Toledo 11, the news channel. When it comes to education, our money should go to the classroom. That's why I'm voting no on George Voinovich's $1 billion tax hike. He should have cut other spending before raising taxes. And there isn't even a guarantee the money will go to the classroom. You won't find the word guarantee anywhere in Issue 2. Anywhere. It's no more guaranteed for education than the lottery. Helping our children means fixing education first. You're looking at a new man and a new woman. Tell them about my brand new pal, the orthodontist. You'll find out it's fun. It sounds crazy, but it's true. Let's hear some moms. These orthodontists are really different. The staff becomes family and the orthodontist a new pal. Embrace yourself, no payment up front, and only $98 a month. And look at these smiles. Call 1-800-BRACES-4 and meet your new pal, the orthodontist, Dr. Robert Neme. Joining us now is Dana Reeve, Christopher's uh, wife of six years, and his new book, which is just, I was just telling him, you know, I have to read a lot of books for the show, and sometimes I'll start out reading, and I'm just going to kind of scan the whole thing, and I started reading and could not put it down, and it took the whole day to read Still Me, which it is just so powerful, and I tell you, I read this book, and I want to be a better person. Um, he shares... Uh, an incredibly moving story on um, page, I think it's about page 32. He says, Dana came into the room, she stood beside me, and I mouthed my first lucid words to her, long haul, no matter what. Then she added the words that saved my life, you're still you, and I love you. And that's why the book is called Still Me. And as Christopher is just describing here, if you'd looked away or paused or hesitated even slightly, or if he had felt in any way that there was a sense of nobility about it, things could have been totally different. <laughs> I know, what a responsibility. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, <laughs> but that was, uh, was absolutely from the heart, and it was something that just came out. And that's just... Uh... <laughs> well, you know what's amazing is that the world doesn't often get a chance to see love like this, so pure, so strong. You know, we read about it in novels, and everybody hopes that they would have it. Mm -hmm. How did you know that you had it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, there, our love is incredibly strong, but I think that part of what makes our bond so strong is that we know each other's good and bad, and that we accept that. And we, for years, you know, just had a relationship that was...
complicated than it still is, and it's but at the bottom line, we are absolutely joined at the hip, and and we're very direct with each other. We're very forgiving of each other. I don't know. You just know when you feel right. You feel at home. Did you know what you were in for when you made that statement there in the hospital that day? I knew what I was in for when I said I do. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I knew what I was in for. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> when you got the call, weren't you still back at the hotel? We were, uh -huh. we were staying at a Holiday Inn near, um, near the grounds where the horse show was. And Will, who was just not quite three, was um, home, well, at the hotel taking a nap. And we were going to go over. And I remember looking at the clock and saying, oh, 3.01, that was his start time. But I thought, I'll let, I'll let Will sleep. And then he woke up, Will woke up at around 3.15, and right when the phone was ringing. And that was... Yeah. Was it, weren't you, wasn't I the call, I had an idea that it was Bill? Bad, yes that he'd had a spill mm -hmm. and that they'd taken him off in a stretcher. So I knew that it was not a broken arm. Um, but I really didn't know how bad it was, and I just went over to the small hospital. And then in the emergency room, there was only one other person there, and she was kind of flipping through a magazine. And um, I could hear a helicopter outside, and I thought, oh, that's for somebody. I hope it's not for him. And... Then when I kept saying, I said, you know, I'm, I'm Dana Reeve, I'm, my husband was brought here, and they said, oh, oh, just a minute, just a minute, no one would say anything, and I thought, oh, okay, let's just wait, let's just wait, and then when the nurses said, well, the doctor wants to see you, and two nurses came, and one took each elbow and walked me down the hall, I thought, oh, this is, they think I'm going to collapse, so this is serious, and I had Will, and then What did the doctors me. tell you? I, I hate talking about this because it's the time when um, such a strong visceral sense of before and after in um, our life, how at 2.59 things were one way and at 3.05 or whenever, whenever that jump, it, everything changed completely. Um, the doctor in Culpeper said, I'm very worried about your husband. Those are the first words. And then he proceeded to tell me that he'd had a cervical injury and that he was not breathing on his own, that they were going to take him to UVA. And he and that he was, uh, but he didn't say, he may have said that we're uh, paralysis, but it was not sinking in at that point. The main thing was is that he wasn't breathing. That was really what I was hearing. And uh, it was shocking, but I also knew I had to get to Col I had to get to Virginia. I had to. They were going to take him in the helicopter. I couldn't go with them. I had to drive there. I needed directions. I needed, you know. And um, the the guy who had called me on the phone was also there, and he said, "Do you want me to? Um, do you want me to drive you?" And I said, "No, no. I want to do this myself." And I actually called up my father, who is a doctor and who throughout my life has always translated medical things for me. And, and somehow, you know, I, it was the only person I really wanted to talk to. Miraculously, he was home on Memorial Day weekend on a Saturday afternoon. So I was able to talk to him. And when I, when I said, Chris has fallen and he's hurt his neck, my father said, oh, God, because he knew that what, what you, that means. Yeah, and that if I was calling from the hospital. And then I just started to cry. And, and um, he talked to the doctor. Meanwhile, then, I was being loaded into this helicopter, and the helicopter's named Pegasus, mm -hmm. a flying horse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before, um, we did get to see him before he went into the helicopter, Will and I. It was all in a rush, but they said, um, you know, he's fly he, they said they were worried about him, and they weren't sure if he was going to be all right, and they said, do you want to see him before he goes? And I said, yes. Um... And I had Will holding Will, and Chris was on the stretcher, stabilized, still in his riding clothes. And um, he had this, they have these yellow sort of stabilization things. And Will is asking me questions, why is Daddy, why are Daddy's eyes closed? Why is Daddy sleeping? Is he okay? And um, why does he look scary? And, um, and then I just remember saying to Chris, I just was said, you know, hang on, keep breathing. And I kind of knew that he wasn't breathing, but that somehow... His body was breathing, so whatever it took, I just wanted him to get to the hospital and that he would be there when I got there. And he was. Wow. But they told her to say goodbye. It might be for the last time. It was 50-50. Uh, 
I suffered was called a hangman's injury, which is uh, the same thing as if you've been dropped through the trap door and then cut down and sent to rehab. Um, that's the injury that happens when you hang someone. And so literally, uh, my head was disconnected from my body, and uh, uh, only my neck muscles were holding on. And uh, the surgery that they did five days later is a miracle. Uh, Dr. Jane of UVA. Uh, and had they not done it before, you found that out afterwards? Yeah, uh, they had to actually uh, make up an operation. They rehearsed it. But to figure out what to do, um, they ended up putting a titanium rod uh, or connecting the top of my spine to the base of my skull and then drilling holes in the bottom of my brain and uh, wiring them together. And uh, I don't know anybody else in the world who could have accomplished that. So I was very, very lucky. You are Superman. <laughs> Chris was unable to take a single breath on his own. When we come back, he shares one of his most terrifying experiences. It's called a pop-off, when your air hose becomes disconnected and you can't move, of course, to rehook it. Back in a moment. do you have to have, which I know you describe with, in detail in the book, um, how many people are responsible for helping you to function every day? Well, uh, I need a 24-hour-a-day nurse uh, because of the, being on the ventilator. Um, and can I talk to you about that ventilator? I'm thinking, uh, could we not invent a ventilator that doesn't pop off? Yeah, <laughs> well, actually, uh, all it takes is a little, uh, a little duct tape. Really? Because in the beginning you described yeah. um, being in the hospital and having having the pop off. And always in the middle of the night. And then the nurse comes in, can't find it, and uh, I can't. Pop off meaning the ventilator it literally separates, the and you can't the yeah. tube separates. Oh, it just comes off, right? And you have how long? Um, you got a couple, about a minute. About a minute. A couple of minutes, maybe, yeah. And suppose she's on the phone with her boyfriend or something. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll tell you, a terrible thing happened. Uh, and there was a lady at home that was vent dependent, and uh, the nurse was downstairs, and uh, she had a little, uh, a little something to drink, and she passed out. And the woman upstairs had a pop off, and uh, the ventilator alarm was screaming, and the nurse didn't hear it, and the woman suffocated. Wow. And uh, do you know what the defense lawyer's argument was? that you have no quality of life anyway. And so when I heard about that, I said, uh, I'm going to come in and testify. So does it still do that? Does the ventilator still have the, it still pops off? Still does? I haven't had a pop off in over a year. We use duct tape now. You use duct tape now. Yeah. You have to have the tubing because it, they need, it needs to be changed and cleaned and you need to, it has to just be a temporary thing. It I know, but when I was reading this, I'm thinking, somebody fix the ventilator. <laughs> yeah, it's plastic on metal and that's why it slides off. Yeah. But and so, and wouldn't you, you would just be there many a time staring into space, fearing that it would pop off because anything could cause it to pop off. That's right. Yeah. And you think, uh, you know, this could happen in any minute, but I haven't had a pop off in, in a year. Long time. Yeah. yeah. And now, if you yeah. did, it's not even. Also, now I can breathe. Now, I can so breathe now you can breathe. So yeah. it's not on your own. But tell me this wasn't, was, you, you talk about it um, some in, in Still May. The a one, a life changing moment for you was appearing at the Oscars. I remember oh, when gosh, Quincy yeah. Jones called me and told me that he had the idea to invite you to the Oscars, and I said, I Huge! That is going to be <laughs> huge! I'm really crazy. I'm really crazy. I, I had only been out once before in public, and uh, Quincy called and said, You know, would you come out and do a thing? And I said, I'd think about it, and they said, Yes. And uh, were you I scared? Realized, were you scared? Uh, well, I. I wheeled into Dana that I've just agreed to go out on the Oscars live in front of two billion people. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I haven't been out anywhere yet, you know. <laughs> so why don't we start big? <laughs> <laughs> and Christopher 
this year book, Bill May. He is extremely candid about the personal details of, um, of his life today. Uh, and he describes his daily routine, which starts when Will, their five-year-old son now, comes into his room, getting him out of bed and dressing, uh, can take up to three hours. Is that true? Yeah, I'm pretty ready. Really? Yeah, because in the morning, uh, the first thing that has to happen is called ranging, and that's where uh, the, the aide will move all my arms and uh, legs and, you know, get everything, keep everything flexible. And that's the process, and then we do an exercise. I have uh, electric um, stimulation machines. I put on a pair of uh, pants called uh, Bioflex, and uh, what they do is they have electrodes in them that um, move all the muscles, stimulate all the muscles. And I do that in the legs, the abs, and the arms. So I'm still in pretty good shape, uh, avoiding muscle atrophy. One thing you really got to fight is muscle atrophy and uh, uh, loss of bone density and uh, loss of circulation, all of those things. Uh, and so the pants with the electrodes yeah. helps that, helps stimulate the muscles? Right. So it's like exercising, but you don't really have to? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's one for the abdominals, and all of the nurses and all of us are saying, like, give me that. <laughs> Hollywood 
Walk of Fame. That was uh, last year, April 15th, 1997, almost two years uh, after his accident. Do you believe you will walk again? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm not... A... But in, in that picture of the Walk of Fame, uh, only our youngest son was there, and uh, I have uh, two older children who I have my pride and joy. My daughter, Alexandra, is 14, and my son, Matthew, uh, who's 18, and now a big grown-up, and uh, <laughs> he's here with us today. Matthew, can you say hi? Matthew. <laughs> say hi. to get through, well, certainly many ordeals, but certainly one to the extent of where your life is completely turned around uh, and you have to redefine what life is for yourself without family support. Well, you know what I found is the key to the whole thing? What? The difference between being and doing. Um, like with my kids, we used to do a lot of things. I taught them to ski and sail and play tennis. I played the piano when my daughter played the bassoon and we I did all these activities together. But actually, uh, sometimes just sitting down for a couple hours and really just being together is even more rewarding for both of us. So uh, even if I've lost the physical activity sometimes, the content of what's going on between us is even better and even closer. The content. Yeah, the relationship is even stronger. Um, you mentioned in, in Still Me um, that you're not going to have, you've decided that you're not going to have yeah, more children. You know, uh, and I remember in the first interview with Barbara, it was one the, on Friday too, but in the very first interview, you, you said specifically, I recall, that you were thinking about having a child. You know what the problem is, at least for me, is for the sensory, uh, sensory deprivation. You know, uh, if I had my arms... It might be different, but now it's three years since I've uh, given Will a hug, and that hurts me more than it hurts him, I guess, but uh, I really don't want to bring another child into the world that I can't uh, have the same physical relationship that I had with the others. But there's also, there are three other children to consider, and there's Matthew and Alexandra and Will, and just, this is, um, it's such a life change. It's so important to us that they're okay and that they're doing fine and that they're getting as much attention and mm -hmm. consideration as possible. And I really think ultimately we were going in one direction and we were going to have a child and we just said, well, then let's just, we'll just keep doing it. And if we wanted to, we could, which is the miracle of <laughs> modern medicine. It's really fantastic. But I can't the, quite figure out how you could, but I'm going <laughs> to leave that alone. Uh. <laughs> um, well, we could. Um, <laughs> But I think we, ha we go through the same discussions that any couple would go through who are deciding whether to have a child, whether to have a second child. You weigh everything. Does it work with our life as it is right now? And, and really, at the moment, it, it doesn't. And it's a decision. We've got three of the best already. Already, yeah. Wow. So. Christopher <laughs> received 400,000 letters from all over the world during his ordeal. And uh, in the book that he has written, um, still me, he talks about how much each one of those letters meant to him to lift his spirits many times uh, because I'm sure you couldn't respond to 400,000 right. people. But you all who wrote should know that all of those letters meant so much to Christopher Reeve and to his family. His family would read the mail to him mm. and many days he would just love to listen to the people in the letters. Mm. And one of those people who wrote to Christopher was uh, Stephen. Stephen, welcome. Would you read us your letter? Dear Mr. Reeve, when I first heard of your accident, a part of me felt sad that a superstar like yourself could succumb to such a devastating injury. Another part of me said, at least it didn't happen to me. But one weekend in June, the most unthinkable and ironic thing happened. We were enjoying the summer sun when I dove off a rock into a lake and landed head first. I broke my neck at the C6 level and was motionless from the chest down. In a way, I'm glad this has happened to me because it has brought me closer, closer to some things I might have lost. Just like you, I will be walking within the next 10 years or sooner. I'm 25 years old and I grew up watching you on the silver screen. You were my childhood idol. I now see you as a real life idol 
and I hope I can feed off your aggressiveness to defeat this injury. Don't give up. Sincerely, Steve Drew. During his ordeal, that is amazing. That is amazing. So you hadn't had your accident. It was one month after his. Wow. Just graduated from college. Oh, man. That's so wonderful. Thank you. But anything can happen to anybody, you know. Um, I remember the last movie I did, I played a paraplegic. A movie called Above Suspicion, and I went to a rehab center. And I worked with the people there so I could simulate being a paraplegic. And every day I'd get in my car and drive away and go, thank God that's not me. I have to admit that. And then seven months later, I was in this condition. Um, and I remember, in a way, the smugness of that, um, as if I was, you know, privileged in some way. But the point is, we're all one great big family. And any one of us could get hurt at any moment. So uh, that taught me a really big lesson about complacency. You know, we should never walk by somebody who's uh, in a wheelchair and be afraid of them or think of them as a stranger. Could be us. In fact, it is us. Coming up, she wanted to tell the world why her husband is her hero and asked us to help her do that. Next, their powerful story of love and devotion back in a moment. If you wanted to treat every child in Ohio fairly, what would you do? You would bring warmth to schools where there is scarce heat. You would bring books to children who have not yet learned to read. And you would bring technology to classrooms where they don't yet dare to dream. On May 5th, be fair to every child in Ohio, no matter where they live. Vote for issues one and two, because every child counts. Tomorrow, first at five, move to the suburbs, not for these people. Meet city homeowners who say their neighborhoods have changed, but they're staying put. I couldn't move. I don't believe I could move. I can go away for a while and come home and just love it all over again. Meet city homeowners who say their neighborhoods have changed, but they're staying put. Tomorrow, first at five. The best forecasters and meteorologists, plus Super Doppler 11, the area's only live local radar. The team, the technology, only on Toledo 11, the news channel. I'm just a simple, complicated woman. Contradiction, a new fragrance for a woman from Calvin Klein. Especially for Mother's Day, this Contradiction gift set, a $92 value, yours for $65. Out of regular, wake them up with decaffeinated Folgers. It has the same rich mountain-grown taste and aroma as regular Folgers, so they'll never know it's decaffeinated. Hey guys, I was thinking next year, maybe we could switch to decaf. Paul is shining shoes. Someday Paul will be a famous chef. He will invent a new wonder food. See, Garden Burger, the burger with no meat. Uh-oh, Paul's testing them on truck drivers and construction workers. Surprise, they are tasty and good. Now Paul's famous. He's on TV. He is loved by millions, especially cows. Discover Garden Burger, all natural, really tasty, end of story. Because eating good just got great. Here's what's happening tomorrow. At only 15, she made history landing the Olympic gold. Skating champ, Tara Lipinski. So why does she now want to leave all that behind? What do you want to say to the critics? Then I call him my son, Iger Wood. So are you seeing anybody that you'd like to, to tell your mom about this? And how his father, Earl, moved him to tears. You will be my little man forever. Love, Pop. Plus, Monica Lewinsky, Paula Jones, and Linda Tripp. It's the great name mix-up. That is tomorrow, and later in this... A letter from Ramon Davis. Her husband, Robert, doesn't know this, but she wrote to tell us why she thinks um, that he is her hero and asked for the opportunity to share their story with the world. So, surprise, Robert. <laughs> Here's what your wife told us about you. Dear Oprah, the reason for this letter is to profess my love to my husband. James Robert Davis, Jr. is my best friend. I met Robert about five years after he was in a motorcycle accident that left him a T6 paraplegic in his 25th year of life. 
This man wakes up every day and drags around more than half of his lifeless body with aches and pains that we can never imagine. He helps others deal with their grief every day, never complaining of his own pain and loss. Robert speaks to young children about his disabilities and the fulfilling life he still leads. He has touched so many people in his life in such a positive manner. He has no clue the impact his mere presence is to others. Robert was concerned about our slim chance to have children, and I immediately told him that not having my own children would be very difficult, but not having him in my life would be unthinkable. Robert and I were married, and I gave birth to, I hope, one of many children. We beat the odds. I want to thank him for the love he gives me and our son every day. A lot of times, it's almost funny because so many people look at me in the beginning and shake their heads. You know, that typical, oh, how wonderful look, how wonderful of her. And it's so funny because it really has nothing to do with me. If he wasn't such an incredible man, I would have never fallen so deeply and madly in love with him like I am. It's a wonderful feeling to be his wife. Sincerely, Raymond G. Davis. Ramon and Robert had only a 6% chance of having a baby, and they not only beat the odds once but twice, because Ramon is now three months pregnant with their second child. Christopher Reeve's book, uh, Still Me, he says that when the first Superman movie came out, I was frequently asked, what is a hero? I remember the glib response I repeated so many times. My answer was that a hero is someone who commits a courageous action without considering the consequences, a soldier who crawls out of a foxhole to drag an injured buddy to safety. Now my definition is completely different. I think a hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. A 15-year-old boy landed on his head while wrestling with his brother, leaving him barely able to swallow or speak. Travis Roy pra paralyzed in the first 30 seconds of a hockey game in his freshman year at college. These are real heroes, and so are the families and friends who have stood by them. Back in a moment. From Carol that we wanted to share with you. She wrote us about her daughter, Kim. Take a look. Dear Oprah, on July 7, 1996, my 16-year-old daughter Kim was in a car accident that left her a quadriplegic. Daily life for her and our entire family was changed in an instant that day. Kim is one of the most special people I've ever known. She could be bitter, but she's not. Shortly after her accident, we were watching some young children get fitted for their wheelchairs. My daughter suddenly turned to me and said, At least I had my legs for 16 years, but some children will never know what it's like to walk. Right then I knew she'd be okay. Kim has shown so many people that just because she can't fit under a table at a restaurant or in most bathrooms, life hasn't ended. We take one day and one challenge at a time, but also look to the future. So far, not much has stopped us. Sincerely, Carol Van Batavia. Kim is graduating from high school this year and headed for college. Thank you. We'll be right back. Kim! Christopher Reeve's new book is called Still Me. It is the impassioned story of how um, he and his family came to grips with the kind of devastating, unexplainable shock that fate can bring to any one of us at any time. You read it. You'll, you will appreciate life in the moment, wherever you are in the moment. And um, maybe it'll do for you what it did for me. You just want to be a better person. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you both. If you want to find out how you can support the Christopher Reeve Foundation, you can call this number. It's our hotline, 312-591-9444. You know, when I first heard you say this to Barbara, that you were going to walk again, I believe you. I believe that that is going to happen. I believe you. I believe you. Thank you.